you will hear a conversation between a woman and a policeman. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Bumbley Police Station. How can I help you? Yes, I need to report a stolen bag. Just a moment, and I'll put you through to lost and stolen property. Hello, Sergeant Rhodes speaking. Can I help you? Yes, hello. I'd like to report a stolen bag. Hmm. Okay, a stolen bag. Uh, we've been getting a lot of these lately. I'll need to get some details. Uh, let's see. Uh, when was the last time you had your bag? Well,、uh, about two hours ago. I just can't believe this has happened. I take it everywhere with me. It was given to me as a graduation present. I'm just so upset. Yes, I know.、Uh, it's very frustrating. It seems like I put it down for a second, and then it was gone. Yes. Look, the good news is that most of the stolen bags in our area are found, usually without the money. So I'd be surprised if you don't get it back later. Tell me, what does the bag look like? Well, it's dark blue, cylindrical. It has two carry handles either side of a zipper on top.、Um, the zipper actually runs the length of the bag. It's a Vitoli bag. Okay. Are there any other identifying marks on the bag? Things that would be unique to it,、um, name tags, scuff marks, that kind of thing. Well, not really.、Um, there are a couple of scratches in the top left corner on one side of the bag near the handle, and I think another one in the opposite corner. Okay,、uh, scratches on opposite corners. Now. Where were you when the bag went missing? Well, I remember the time. It was a quarter past twelve. Oh no, actually, it was a bit after that, more like twelve twenty-five, because I was supposed to meet one of my friends for lunch at twelve thirty. Anyway, I was standing outside the supermarket when all of a sudden a group of teenagers came walking past. They must have been heading towards the cinema. They seemed to be in a hurry and probably late for the movie, so I stepped aside to let them by. When they'd passed by, I reached down to pick up my bag, and it was gone. I see. Now, can you remember the contents of the bag? Yes.、Um, let's see. My passport and some traveler's checks. Fortunately, I was carrying my camera, and I had my wallet in my pocket. They're the main valuable things.、Um... Okay.、Uh, anything else at all? Hmm. Let's see. No, I think that was it. Oh, a few pens, but that's all, really. As I say, nothing of real value. Okay, I'm going to have to get your details. Are you here on holiday? Yes. As a matter of fact, I am. I'm visiting from Canada. I've been here for three weeks already, but I'll be here for another month. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now,、uh, have you contacted your credit card company? Yes, I did that immediately. They were very helpful. I still can't believe this could happen to me, and while I'm supposed to be enjoying myself on holiday. Yes, it's a real disappointment, whether you're on holiday or not. Yeah, thieves strike when you least expect it. Anyway, I need to take down your particulars.、Um, what's your name then? Yes,、uh, my name is Helen Reddy. That's R E A D Y. My address is. Well, the place where I'm staying here is the Palms, Unit Fourteen, Seventy Five Paradise Avenue. Okay, I may need your home address in Canada, but I'll get that more towards the time you're going to leave.、Uh, what about the telephone? 
What number will I be able to reach you on? Yes, it's four double five nine one double three two. Okay, uh, four double five nine one double three two. And how much do you think the bag and contents are worth? Well, it's not really a big cost, probably only a hundred dollars. It's the inconvenience of it all. I understand. Look, we have a lot of lost or stolen property recovered daily. Come by the station tomorrow and have a look. As I said, there's a high chance that we'll get the bag back. Your passport, at the very least. Okay. Thanks for your help. See you tomorrow then. Bye. Yes. Bye. That is the end of section one. You now have thirty seconds to check. You are going to listen to part of a radio interview about bottled water. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen and answer questions eleven to sixteen. The day is coming, so my grandfather used to say, when people are going to pay for water. Well, that day has come. Bottled water. How did it come about? Why are people prepared to pay for something that, up until only recently, has been completely free? With me in the studio is Bill Gilroy, founder of UK Water Starters, who promises to shed some light on this topic. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, and hello, everyone. I dare say that not many of your listeners will be aware of this, but the bottled water market in the UK was actually first established a long time before your grandfather. In fact, it was established almost two centuries ago when the beneficial properties of mineral and spring water were recognised. The idea of bottled water meant that people would benefit from it without having to actually travel to the particular spring or well. We humans need water. The human body is actually two thirds water. Yes, we're about sixty-six percent water, and that water must be continuously replaced. In fact, on average, we lose one third of a liter of water on a daily basis just through normal breathing. Nutritionists say we need to drink at least. Two liters of water a day. This need for water for the body ensures the bottled water industry will be around for a long time.、Mm. Mm. Now, historically, the bottled water market gradually developed. It was well known in the early 19th century that bottled water was beneficial, but during the mid 19th century, the artificial mineral water market became a commercial viability for many entrepreneurs. Later on that century, this led to the emergence of the soft drink market as we know it today, which, of course, is a very large and sophisticated market. Underlying the move from the artificial mineral water to soft drinks was a fundamental change in the use of the product. Whilst in the early days mineral waters were drunk for their medicinal values, soft drinks are, of course, drunk primarily for their ability to refresh and to be enjoyed. As a result of this move, bottled mineral water, without any sweetening agents added, steadily became unfashionable, and the market by the 1960s had declined to an almost non-existent level in the UK. The move during the 1960s, and to a lesser extent the 1970s, towards more processed foods impacted upon the bottled water market, and subsequently sales continued to decline. Of course, today in the 21st century, this is not the case. But interestingly, in the mid 1980s, an unexpected revolution moved the bottled water market forward with the introduction of a new recyclable plastic material that was used worldwide. This new, lighter, stronger material improved packaging and handling, and was also visually appealing. It was during this time that bottled water sales began to improve. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty.
Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So, Bill, tell us what's led to the present-day popularity of bottled water. Well, as your listeners would know, bottled water in recent times has become very popular again. Some of the factors which have led to a resurgence of interest in bottled water are related to the growing use of wine alternatives with many main meals served in restaurants. There is a growing number of people who simply don't like wine. Instead, they prefer bottled waters in one form or another. Although Grandpa used to mutter <laughs> about people paying for water, price has never really played a part because people expect to pay a little extra when dining out. In addition, with air travel becoming less expensive, huge numbers of people started to travel abroad to places where bottled water was readily available and often considered the only safe water to drink. Of course, there are some few who bring their own water from home, but as you know, water is extremely heavy to carry in large quantities. In the early days, the catering and restaurant markets used to be the main purchasers of bottled water. Before long, however, supermarkets began to capitalise on in-home consumption and the UK bottlers began local manufacturing. The market today in total consumes in the region of 50 million litres, which equates to about 30 million pounds sterling. Of course, part of this total goes through the catering markets. The take-home sector comprising both corner stores and the major supermarkets account for the other half. I'd now like to shift focus a little and briefly talk about... That is the end of Section 2. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. You are going to listen to a conversation between three university students, Alice, Paul and Michelle. They are discussing various aspects of an upcoming biology assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Paul. Hi, Alice. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Paul. Where are you going with all those books? Well, I'm preparing for my marine studies paper. Really? What are you doing your paper on? I haven't even started mine. Well, since I've always been interested in communication, I wanted to take a closer look at how aquatic animals communicate. Communicates? Really, Paul? You think that's interesting? Well, yes, Alice. Actually, it's been much more interesting than I had expected it would be. I'm finding the information fascinating. I bet you'd be surprised at some of the things I've learned. Yeah, like what? Well, much of the world is covered by water, but it wasn't really until the first third of the 20th century that people even began to explore the depths of the ocean. Prior to its exploration, scientists just thought of it as a completely silent world. Of course, today we know it is full of sounds. Such as? Well, all kinds of living things in the ocean, from prawns to whales, call back and forth to each other. How do we know that prawns talk to one another? Good question. The answer is we listen to them. How scientists do it is through a special device called the hydrophone. Now, what a hydrophone does is convert the sound energy into electrical energy. It's a very clever device. Kind of like a water telephone? Well, yes. Quite like that, except the communication is only one way. Sounds more like spying on animals to me. Well, I suppose it is to a certain degree. Scientists can hear all kinds of sounds. Grunting, crackling, buzzing. It turns out that the ocean is quite a noisy place. 
Many underwater sounds have been identified, but even more still await classification. Fish in a public aquarium are quite, well, talkative. So scientists have been able to record their sounds and match them with mystery calls heard from the open sea. So who's the noisiest in the underwater world? I'll bet it's the dolphin. You're right, the dolphin is noisy. But by far the most widespread and persistent noisemakers are the smaller animals living in the sea. Not fish, but an animal that lives on the sea floor and grows no more than about five centimetres. Here, have a look at this table I've started. Ah, I see. The snapping shrimp is the noisiest sea creature. This is interesting. It makes its sharp snapping sound with its enlarged claw, which also functions like a water pistol. Yes, I was reading millions of these animals just offshore have been known to frighten people walking along the beach in Japan. And this is interesting. It says here that seahorses in an aquarium made such a loud noise that people could hear them from across the room. These little creatures are amazing. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Say, Paul, your early research has really prompted me to get started on my own paper. You look like you've already done quite a lot of work on it, but the assignment isn't due for at least another month. Is that right? Um, let's see, Michelle. I think you may be a little wrong there. Let me get my class folder and we'll have a look. I know that our class participation is worth 30%, but what's this assignment worth? Isn't it 40%? Um, here it is. Yes. Uh, actually, it's worth 30%. It's the second assignment due later on that's worth 40%. It says here, OK, there are three pieces of assessment. There's the two assignments and the in-class feedback on student oral presentations, which forms part of assignment two. Now, it says that the first written assignment is composed of three parts. Yes, I recall the professor talking about those, especially the word length for part one. The research essay, it's 1200, isn't it? It's due in week six? Yes, that's correct for part one, but only 800 for part two, the field study, which is due in week seven. Ah, oh, that's bad news. I thought I had much more time than that. I don't know how I could have been so wrong. I guess I need to purchase a diary or I'm going to get left behind. Yes, I write all my due dates on a monthly calendar which hangs on the wall next to my desk. I found that this has helped me to stay organised. I usually divide the project into weeks. Each week, I set aside some time for all of my assignments. For example, part three, the report on findings, isn't due till week nine, but I've already started working on it. Wow, I'm impressed. I guess you lead a pretty worry-free life. Not at all. It just means I get a little more sleep than most students around the due date of the assignment. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, you certainly have inspired me. Yeah, me too. I'll be purchasing a desk calendar as soon as I get a chance. Well, I'm off. Alice, Michelle, it was great talking to both of you. All the best with your assignments. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. That is the end of Section 3. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. You are going to listen to a talk from a horse expert, Dr. Alan Sampson. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone. It's my pleasure to talk to you today and I hope that my experience will help you as you choose your course of study here at the university. There are a number of key areas that I want to highlight in my talk with you today. Firstly, I hope to show that there are real career opportunities in the equine or horse industry. Also, I want to point out the qualifications you'll need in order to find employment within the industry. A lot of people look at horse training and other equine activity as being a task that can be done by anyone. I hope to show you today that this is far from true by pointing out some of the typical tasks that those employed within the horse industry are expected to carry out on a regular basis. I think you'll see that our work is far from a simple activity and requires discipline and dedication. Our riding school for young riders and an in-depth look at the principles of dressage, the French word meaning training, I won't have time for today, but we'll discuss in later sessions. And although beyond the scope of my talk today, breeding is also an incredibly interesting area of study, which I look forward to sharing with you at a later date. Perhaps I should begin my talk by giving you a broad brush overview of the equine industry and where it's headed. Today, the industry is a multi-million pound concern. Many areas of the horse or thoroughbred industry, as it is often called, are expected to continue to expand as part of the national growth trend in leisure industries. The large investment of the Middle Eastern countries in the 1980s and the more recent investments from the Japanese has had a large influence in the development of the current strong market for both racing and breeding stock here in England. Currently, the thoroughbred industry is generating more than £900 million per year in exports alone. As you can imagine, opportunities exist in many branches of the thoroughbred industry. In fact, in a number of areas, the industry is really expanding. Here in England, around 50,000 people are employed in the primary equine industry and a further 20,000 in ancillary industries. Of course, as with all other industries, practical experience is essential to provability and commitment. Although I said the employment outlook for those working in the equine industry is favourable, employers are increasingly looking for more experience and higher qualifications. Individuals intending to take up study often ask me which courses I recommend. Well, there is a good selection of courses to choose from. Personally, when I began in the industry, I enrolled in a part-time certificate in equine management course. It's a good way to gain a general overview of the industry, but offers only minimal career opportunities for graduates. The Bachelor of Equine Science and Thoroughbred Management courses offer a more in-depth look at specific learning areas. Horse riding theory, grooming and saddling are covered as well as the more scientific areas such as the history and characteristics of breeds, my current area of research, as well as such topics as anatomy and safety in horse handling. From this degree, students can choose to undertake postgraduate studies. By far, the two most common employment areas for university graduates within the equine industry is equitation, which is, by definition, the act or art of riding a horse, and horse training and management, which involves such diverse activities as instruction, stable upkeep, and horse show entries. For those of you looking for long-term, secure employment within the industry, I recommend undertaking some kind of educational coursework. These days, just to be a stable hand, job seekers are presenting with college certificates which are increasingly becoming the minimum level of education. Working in racehorse stud management, grassland management and equine exercise and nutrition requires a Bachelor of Science and no longer will the bachelor's degree suffice when it comes to specialised equine health and research. 
only postgraduates or PhDs are now finding employment in these kinds of areas. I'd now like to take a brief look at the degree to which... The that is the end of section 4. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. That is the end of the practice lab test. At the end of the real IELTS test, you would now be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.